Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the members of the National Space Council. Elaine Chow, Secretary of the Department of Transportation. Patrick Shanahan, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Defense. Russ Volt, Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Susan Gordon, Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence. Karen Dunn Kelly, Acting Deputy Secretary of the Department of Commerce. Claire Grady, Acting Deputy Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Jim Bridenstine, Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Andre Thompson, Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. General Paul Selva, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Michael Crossios, Deputy Assistant to the President for Science and Technology. Admiral Doug Fears, Deputy Assistant to the President and Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor. Dr. William Happer, Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of Emerging Technologies for the National Security Council. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 16th President of the National Defense University, Vice Admiral Fritz Rogge. Well, Mr. Vice President, members of the National Space Council, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome here to Roosevelt Hall and to the National Defense University. I'm honored to welcome you to our campus, where we educate and develop national security leaders for the military services, U.S. government departments and agencies, industry partners, and for our international friends, partners, and allies. This is the University of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We are a graduate school tasked to transform mid-career professionals who come to us as tactical and operational experts and turn them into strategically-minded leaders who are ready to take on the thorniest security challenges. Our success in reaching that goal ultimately is measured by their ability to contribute to peace and security. And if we do our job well, our graduates will be able to launch the kinds of ideas that might preclude the need to launch ordnance. The growing importance of the space domain to America's national security creates a logical rationale for conducting this meeting here at the National Defense University and here in the home of our National War College, Roosevelt Hall. In 1903, President Teddy Roosevelt laid the cornerstone of this building, and within a year of that date, America's appreciation for the aerospace domain began when the Wright brothers made the world's first sustained flight of heavier-than-air powered aircraft. I also think that President Roosevelt might have appreciated the National Space Council's work. Referring in 1902 to America's posture in a different domain, he once observed that a good navy is not a provocation to war. It is the surest guarantee of peace. And the Council's work to inform and guide America's endeavors in space seems to me to be a corollary applicable to the space domain. And in the 115 years since that first flight, our nation's military and economic strength have been heavily influenced by our leadership in air and space. Over the past 21 months, this administration has made it a top priority to confront the emerging security challenges we face in space, which is what brings us here today. Leading the effort to fulfill the President's vision for American leadership in space is the Vice President of the United States. As the son of a Korean War combat veteran and the proud father of a United States Marine, the Vice President is a strong defender of our uniformed men and women who wear the cloth of our nation. So please join me in welcoming to the National Defense University, the Chairman of the National Space Council, and the 48th Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence.
Thank you all. And thank you to Vice Admiral Rogge for your kind introduction and for your leadership here at this storied institution. Would you join me in thanking him one more time for his hospitality and his extraordinary leadership? Members of the Cabinet, Congressman Babin, members of our armed forces, distinguished guests, and to the men and women of this storied institution dedicated to educating, developing, and inspiring America's national security leaders, it is my honor and my privilege to be here at the National Defense University. And it's also my great honor to be here today with the fourth meeting of the National Space Council. Join me in thanking all the members of our cabinet who have engaged so energetically in President Trump's vision for renewed American leadership in space. Can I ask all of them to stand? All the members of the National Space Council, you have our thanks. And to them and to all of you, I bring greetings this morning from our Commander-in-Chief and a great champion of the armed forces of the United States of America and a president who is committed to securing American leadership here on Earth and in the vast expanses of space. I bring greetings from the 45th President of the United States of America, President Donald Trump. In his inaugural address, the President declared that America stands, in his words, at the birth of a new millennium, ready to unlock the mysteries of space. And so we are. Since that day, our administration has worked tirelessly to extend our nation's proud legacy of leadership in the heavens. In just 16 months since relaunching the National Space Council, President Trump has signed three new space policy directives to rejuvenate our nation's space enterprise and reignite the spark of urgency that propelled America to the vanguard of space exploration a half century ago. Under these new policies, NASA is preparing to send our astronauts back to the moon and to build the capacity to put Americans on the red sands of Mars. We're also modernizing out-of-date regulations to unleash America's trailblazing commercial space industry. And we're implementing a new space traffic management policy to protect our nation's vital assets in the congested orbital environment. But our Commander-in-Chief's highest priority is the safety and security of the American people. And while the last administration too often failed to meet the growing security threats in space, President Trump has stated forcefully a truth that the leaders of the National Defense University have long understood, that space is a war-fighting domain just like the land, air, and sea, and America will be as dominant there as we are here on Earth. <laughs> to meet the emerging threats on this new battlefield, to prepare America's best and bravest, to deter and defeat a new generation of adversaries on that new horizon, we're creating a sixth branch of the United States Armed Forces. In June, the President directed the Department of Defense to begin the process necessary to establish a United States Space Force. This is the next and natural evolution of our armed forces, and it's absolutely necessary to ensure American supremacy in space. Since the dawn of the space age, the United States has recognized the vital importance of space to our national defense. Over the past 60 years, we've assembled the world's largest and most sophisticated constellation of surveillance, navigation, and communication satellites that increase the agility, precision, and lethality of America's armed forces. Today, I'm proud to report that there are tens of thousands of military personnel, civilians, and contractors operating and supporting our space systems, the eyes and the ears of America's warfighters around the world. These men and women serve with distinction across our defense and intelligence agency, and no organization has done more to advance American leadership in space than the United States Air Force. As 
As General Salva knows, the airmen who run our nation's space programs are the best in the world. And since its earliest days as America's newest branch of the service, the Air Force has faithfully served as the steward of our nation's most vital assets, orbiting the Earth as well. But today, space is fundamentally different than it was a generation ago. What was once desolate and uncontested is increasingly crowded and confrontational. And today, other nations are seeking to disrupt our space-based systems and undermine our economic and military might as never before. For many years, nations from Russia and China to North Korea and Iran have pursued weapons to jam, blind, and disable our navigation and communication satellites through electronic attacks from the ground. But recently, our adversaries have been working to bring new weapons of war into space itself. From anti-satellite weapons and airborne lasers to highly threatening on-orbit activities and evasive hypersonic missiles, both China and Russia have been aggressively developing and deploying technologies that have transformed space into a warfighting domain. Since taking office, our administration has taken decisive action to strengthen American power and secure our vital national interests in space. President Trump signed the largest investment in our national defense since the days of Ronald Reagan, including renewed resources to enhance the resilience of our space defense systems, and we are grateful for the support of the Congress of the United States in providing these resources for America's defense. <laughs> Through the new Launch Service Agreement Awards, we're also strengthening our partnerships with private industry to grow our domestic launch systems and accelerate the delivery of new space and counter space capabilities. And under the President's new national space strategy, our administration is uniting America's military, commercial, and civil space sectors as never before to ensure that the United States retains our rightful role as the world's preeminent spacefaring nation. But as President Trump has said, quote, it's not enough to merely have an American presence in space, we must have American dominance in space. And that's exactly why, at President Trump's direction, we are taking steps to establish the United States Space Force as the sixth branch of our military that is separate from and equal to the five other branches. As the President and I believe, creating a Space Force is an idea whose time has come. As the men and women of the National Defense University know well, for decades, one independent study after another has called for reforms to the current organizational structure of our national space capabilities. In 1994, the General Accounting Office published a report highlighting what they described as the fragmented responsibilities over our national security space programs. It was widely read, but widely ignored. In 2001, the Rumsfeld Commission concluded, in their words, that the Department of Defense and the intelligence community are not yet arranged or focused to meet the national security space needs of the 21st century. Seven years later, the Allard Commission arrived at the very same conclusion, though its authors were more direct about it, bluntly stating, quote, no one's in charge of America's security in space. And in July of 2016, the GAO published yet another report examining the dangerous fragmentation of responsibility over our national security space programs, which is spread across more than 60 different federal departments and agencies. This lack of centralized leadership and accountability, we believe, poses a clear and present threat to our capacity to advance our national security in space. It undermines our combatant commander's ability to do their jobs. It puts our warfighters ultimately at risk as they operate on battlefields around the world. The American people will never accept this kind of vulnerability, and neither will we. So as we will focus here today in this meeting of the National Space Council, I believe the time has come to stop studying the problem and start fixing it. The United States Space Force, we believe, is central to the solution that America needs. In August, the Defense Department released a substantive report identifying concrete steps that our administration can take using existing authorities to implement the guidance of our Commander-in-Chief 
to begin to make the Space Force a reality. And for the past two and a half months, our national security leaders have been hard at work to begin standing up the United States Department of the Space Force. I'd especially like to commend Deputy Secretary of Defense Patrick Shanahan and Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Paul Selva, for their outstanding efforts implementing the President's vision to stand up a Space Force. Thank you. Today, the National Space Council will vote to send six strategic recommendations to the President's desk, which will lay out our administration's vision and a roadmap, ultimately, for establishing a Space Force. First, we'll create a new unified combatant command, the United States Space Command, that will establish a dedicated chain of command for Space Force operations, ensure integration across the military, and develop the doctrine, tactics, and procedures of space warfighting in the 21st century. Next, the Secretary of Defense will create a new joint organization, the Space Development Agency, that will break free from ineffective bureaucratic structures and provide the men and women of the Space Force the cutting-edge warfighting capabilities that they need faster and more effectively. In addition to delivering the space warfighting technologies of the future faster than our adversaries will be able to keep up with, we also will ensure that our men and women in uniform can wield these capabilities unencumbered by bureaucracy. And under the leadership of our Commander-in-Chief, we've already removed unnecessary restraints on our commanders and given them rules of engagement they need to confront emerging threats on land and sea and in the air, and we will do the same in space. <laughs> Toward that end, the National Space Council will work with the National Security Council to conduct a comprehensive review of current and future space operational authorities to ensure that our warfighters have the freedom and flexibility they need to deter and defeat any threat to our security in the rapidly evolving battlefield of space. Finally, and most importantly, our administration will work with leaders in Congress to create the United States Space Force as the sixth branch of our armed forces in the next National Defense Authorization Act. Under our constitutional system, only Congress can formally establish a new Department of the Military. Our administration, I'm pleased to report, is already working closely with leaders in the Congress in both parties on both sides of the Capitol building to chart a legislative and budgetary pathway to create a new department that will organize, train, and equip space forces, including both combat and service support functions for offensive and defensive operations. Very soon, with the support of the Congress, the Department of the United States Space Force will be a reality. I'm grateful to the leaders in the Congress for their engagement with us on this important initiative, and I especially want to thank Texas Congressman Brian Babin. He's been a great champion of American leadership in space, who's with us here today, and thank you, Congressman Babin, for your leadership on the United States Space Force. Early next year in the President's budget, we'll call on the Congress to marshal the resources to stand up the United States Space Force. And in the months that follow, we'll work with congressional leaders to enact the statutory requirements in the NDAA to establish this new department by 2020. The time has come to write the next great chapter in the history of the armed forces of the United States, to turn the page to an evolution of our armed forces to meet the challenges and opportunities on that limitless frontier. Our nation's armed forces have always been the vanguard of advancing American leadership beyond the bounds of Earth. The Space Force will ensure a new era of American supremacy in space, but there's much work to do. As the men and women of the National Defense University know well when it comes to defending our nation and protecting our way of life, it is the cost of inaction that we can't afford. With every passing year, what we choose to do in space plays an ever greater role in our security, our prosperity, and to no less extent, the very character and vitality of our nation. Our activities beyond our atmosphere accelerate scientific and medical discoveries. They spur groundbreaking innovations 
revolutionize how we communicate, travel, farm, and trade, launch new businesses and industries, and quite literally create the jobs of the future. And while other nations increasingly possess the capabilities to operate in space, not all of them share our commitment to freedom, to the rule of law, and to peace through strength. So as we continue to advance the prosperity of our people, expand the horizons of human knowledge, and carry our most cherished ideals into this new frontier, we will do this just as we have done through the long and storied history of this country. We will do it with a commitment to American strength and to freedom. In our earliest days as a nation, when American merchant ships came under attack by the Barbary pilots and were forced to pay, in the words of Thomas Jefferson, an enormous tribute to the petty tyrant of Algiers, we sent a squadron of our best Navy ships with names like Constellation, Enterprise, Constitution, and Intrepid to protect our commerce and defend our citizens' lives and liberty. When America's destiny beckoned us westward and generations of pioneers, homesteaders, traders, and entrepreneurs went to carve out a home in the wilderness, we dispatched regiments of the United States Army, frontier regulars, to explore new territories, protect vulnerable settlers, keep the peace, and help tame the Wild West. In the wake of the Second World War, with communism on the march around the globe, we forward deployed America's naval forces to deter our adversaries reassure our allies and keep the sea lanes open for the free flow of commerce. And we made the skies safe for travel and trade by creating the fifth branch of our armed forces, the United States Air Force. In our own day, in this still new century, to ensure that we continue to have unfettered access to operate freely in space, to lead in space for the benefit of the American people and all mankind, we will lead once again we will evolve our armed forces, and we will create the United States Space Force to meet that future. As we take the first bold steps to strengthen our security, promote our prosperity, and advance American ideals in this infinite frontier, we'll do so with American strength, with that same pioneering spirit, and we'll do so as Americans have throughout our generations with the faith of the American people, the same faith that generations of Americans have claimed on behalf of all of those who have taken to the skies in defense of freedom in agents past. We'll have faith in the capacity, the capacity of our pioneers and risk takers to lead without regard to their own personal safety. They'll lead America into the infinite expanse of space, and our confidence will be in them and in all those that support them. And also, we'll, we'll also, I'm sure, breathe a word of, of prayer as those great pioneers go forward in this new endeavor of renewed American security in space, of renewed American exploration and leadership in space. I know many Americans will claim that ancient promise that when we rise on the wings of the dawn and we settle on the far side of the sea, even if we go up to the heavens, May there even his hand guide those who will lead us there, and even his hand hold them fast. With the efforts of the National Space Council, with the unwavering courage of America's men and women in uniform, the continued support and innovation of American people and American industry, and with the vision and the leadership of President Donald Trump, and with God's help, I know we will give America the security she deserves. We will forge a new era of peace through strength in outer space, and America will lead for freedom in that infinite frontier once again. Thank you. God bless you. God bless our armed forces, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. All for being here.
Uh, welcome to this fourth meeting of the uh, National Space Council. Would you join me in thanking the members of the National Space Council and also our user advisory group who join us here today. We're very, very grateful for their efforts and their presence. Uh, I thank you all for your uh, kind attention today and your presence here. And again, I want to thank uh, I want to thank the National War College here at the National Defense University uh, for their warm hospitality um, uh, and uh, uh, and their willingness to accommodate. In these halls, generations of America's finest military leaders have studied and prepared to face and overcome the greatest challenges uh, of their days. Join me in thanking the National Defense University once again for the job they do every day. In June, at our last meeting of the National Space Council, President Trump uh, called for the establishment of the United States Space Force. And uh, as the saying goes, uh, back in Indiana, we didn't let the grass grow uh, on this one. And uh, um, I'm so grateful for the efforts of uh, members of the Council and the User Advisory Group who put together the practical recommendations that we'll be forwarding uh, to the President uh, today. Um, uh, I'm going to ask a few members of the Council and the User Advisory Group to update us on the progress we've made to advance the President's priorities broadly. Um, and uh, let me begin uh, by recognizing the Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Chao. Elaine? Great. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. You and the President's commitment to expanding America's leadership in space is inspiring and so timely. The Space Council is meeting at the dawn of a new era in America's aerospace history, one that historians of the future may dub the rocket renaissance. You know, not so long ago, the aerospace community looked back wistfully on the previous era in space as the good old days. The Saturn V rocket, lunar landing, and the space shuttle seemed like achievements that would never again be equaled. And for 14 long years, the country that put the first man on the moon was no longer number one in rocket launches. In fact, in 2011, when the last space shuttle was launched, not a single commercial satellite was put into space by an American rocket, not one. In 2012, six short years ago, the U.S., the United States, was in third place in commercial space launches. But that's changed thanks to America's commercial space innovators and entrepreneurs. They have developed a variety of systems that revolutionized space launches and driven down the cost of space access. These technologies include air launch systems, small network satellite deployment, and most of all, fully reusable rockets. This wave of astonishing innovations has upended the commercial space sector. In 2017, our country finally regained its position as number one with a record number of launches. And the good news is that we have broken last year's record of, with 35 licensed and permitted commercial space operations in fiscal year 2018. The global space economy is now valued at over 400 or nearly $400 billion a year. And American launch innovators, operators, and workers have captured a significant share of this market. The Department of Transportation is doing all we can to maintain this forward momentum. So let me share some pretty important updates. President Trump's second space policy directive tasked the department, as many of you know, to streamline and transform its commercial space transportation regulations. And the department is hard at work to implement this directive, including considering the option of requiring a single license for all types of commercial space flight launch and reentry operations. And two, replacing prescriptive requirements with performance-based criteria. I'm pleased to report that the department is on track to publish a transformational rulemaking. As we have discussed previously, the proposed rulemaking will provide a much needed update 
to launch and re-entry licensing. And as per the President's and your direction, Mr. Vice President, it will consolidate and revise many launch and re-entry licensing requirements into a single regulation. And the rulemaking will streamline the licensing process while protecting public safety and national security. It will also enable flexible timeframes, redefine when launch begins, and allow the space industry to seek a single license to launch from multiple sites. The goal is, as Mr. Vice President, you have asked us to do, is to simplify the licensing process for launch and re-entry activity, enable novel operations, and reduce costs. The Department was also asked to examine, in cooperation with other Space Council members, launch and re-entry requirements from federally owned launch ranges. This effort has benefited from the extraordinary support of stakeholders from the public and the private sectors. And this was especially true with the FAA's Aviation Rulemaking Committee. This committee is comprised of more than 40 individuals from across the commercial space and aviation sectors, and the committee's final report was instrumental in helping the department craft a proposal that will promote economic growth, maximize innovation, and minimize uncertainty for the private commercial space sector. Issues that you, Mr. Vice President, have told us that you care deeply about. So let me also thank our partners at the Department of Defense and also at NASA. Uh, they've given their time and expertise to this very important effort. This collaboration is and will continue to be critical in streamlining the requirements that apply to commercial space operations from federal launch sites. So, Mr. President, I look forward to continued collaboration with my colleagues on the National Space Council, and thank you for your guidance and direction to us, and that is my report. Thank you. Great. Outstanding. Um, uh, thank, thank you, Secretary Chow. Thanks for your work on, uh, on Policy Directive 2. It is, um, it is um, part and parcel of uh, vision for revitalizing American leadership in space, and um, your efforts will shape uh, Americans' travel to and from space in the future and continue to drive industrial innovation and strengthen our shared industrial base for space leadership. So thank you. we thank you for that. Um, along the same lines with regard to policy, policy directives two and three, uh, let's uh, get a quick report from the De Deputy Secretary of Commerce, uh, Karen Dunn Kelly. Uh, Karen. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Vice President, National Space Council guests, thank you for allowing me to join you today. I send regrets from Secretary Ross, who is on an important overseas mission. Since this council last met in June, Secretary Ross has been very busy advocating for the U.S. commercial space industry around the world. He continues to emphasize our mantra, America must be the flag of choice for space commerce. In June, following last Space Council meeting, the Secretary testified to the House Sciences and Armed Services Committees, along with General Hyten and NASA Administrator Bridenstine, about the importance of President Trump's new space traffic management policy, the first of its kind. That te testimony illustrated the great whole of government effort that, uh, that to address the risk created by space debris to valuable satellites, commercial industry, and potentially human lives. This past summer, Secretary Ross also debuted a space commerce segment to our Select USA Summit, which included 3,000 businesses and government leaders, thanks in part to Virgin Galactic and Lockheed, as well as others. Secretary Ross and his team have also been meeting with dozens of stakeholders to discuss the challenges they face, not the least of which is the burdensome regulation. Commerce is conducting a regulatory reform that will unshackle commerce space sector 
and unleash economic growth. We estimate that our efforts will help to grow the global space economy from its current present value of just under $400 billion to over a $1 trillion. For example, last year, an interagency MOU established concrete deadlines and escalation procedures when timely resolution was not achieved. As a result, the Department's Commercial Remote Sensing Office continues to shorten the licensing timeline. Today, the average time period for all remote sensing licenses is about 62 days, less than half of what it was in 2016 of 140 days, even as the number of licenses have increased. In 2010, there were only 26 licenses. Today, there are 227, and almost half of those licenses have been processed since 2017. The more streamlining the rest lead tape leads to more business. I am also excited to announce that yesterday, in response to President Space Policy Directive 2, the Department submitted to the Office of Management and Budget a new draft rule that, if finalized, will revolutionize the way we regulate the use of cameras in space. This will replace outdated regulation that are slowing down industry achievements. The proposed new rule would establish categories for license applications that exempt certain pre-approved activities from the lengthy review process. It will allow federal government to focus its efforts and proposals on truly warranted national security attentions. In other words, the McLean High School CubeSat Science Project would probably not go through the same review process as a highly advanced sensing satellite. And SpaceX's GoPro camera that uses marketing and showing customers that the payloads have successfully been separated should not be treated the same way as the highly technical camera that can see your shoelaces from space. We look forward to working with OMB and our interagency colleagues to get the proposed rule finalized so that the public can comment. Next, I am pleased to report that last week, the Department sent Capitol Hill a new legislative proposal, the SPACE Act. As directed by SPD2, the proposal calls for creating a consolidated Bureau of Space Commerce to be led by a Senate-confirmed Assistant Secretary. The agency will report directly to the Secretary, coordinating all the Department's space efforts and supporting the Department's larger mission of creating conditions for economic growth and opportunity. Included in the legislative proposal is a provision for mission authorization that will enable America to support a wide range of new space activities. To be clear, the proposal should not be mistaken as expanding government. It is just the opposite. Working with the Regulatory Reform Office, the Bureau will better coordinate, consolidate, and connect space functions across the department. The Bureau will serve as a much-needed storefront for industry within the government. As a priority of the department's strategic plan, advancing commercial space is a whole-of-department initiative. We have already begun to lay the framework and the foundation of the one-stop shop. Our new space team, representing all commer commerce offices and bureaus, meets at least weekly to collaborate on ways to advance the growing economy. Our ITA Advocacy Center has recorded 24 project wins for space companies across the globe valued at $4.3 billion and has a pipeline right now of currently 21 activities which would be valued at a little over $2.8 billion. Even our grant-making agencies, such as the Minority Business Development Administration, awarded $400,000 to the Space Foundation to assist minority businesses. And EDA's Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship solicits space commerce grant applications currently. Our Bureau of Industry and Security is actively engaged in the White House-led interagency discussions on export control reform. And NTIA is working on a holistic spectrum management policies 
that will advance the far-reaching missions envisioned by President Trump and Vice President Pence. Our reinvigorated Office of Space is open for business. Following the last Council meeting, Kevin O'Connell joined the Department in July as the new Director. The position had been left vacant for over a decade. Not anymore. Welcome, Kevin. In fact, Kevin will be leaving this meeting a bit early as he needs to speak in Huntsville tonight on the very topic. Since the Council in June approved SPD 3 and its implementation plan, Commerce and the Department of Defense have been working very closely together. Our senior space officials have been spending time at the Vandenberg Air Force Base and in Colorado Springs to more deeply understand the Department of Defense's existing operations and capabilities. As the partnership, we will soon assemble a cadre of commerce, of commerce employees to work at Vandenberg as the civil, civil agency interfacing on, with industry for space traffic management. We forged strong alliances with the Department of Defense, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Strategic Command, as well as other federal agency partners such as NASA, the State Department, the Department of Defense. We recently submitted our 90-day report for the Space Council, and we look forward to submitting a more detailed plan in December. We meet regularly with private industry, preparing to track, analyze, and safe coordination of space objects. We are already investigating ways to incorporate cloud computing and other advanced technologies into the open architecture data repository to showcase the innovations beneficial to the entire SSA STM enterprise. Finally, I am proud to highlight the department's new space technologies, including the GOES satellite that are improving NOAA's weather forecasting in an unprecedented way. Last month, Hurricane Florence's NOAA's five-day hurricane track forecast accurately predicted the storm's landfall within two miles. That's not been done before. What this does is it enables state governors to more quickly declare emergencies, order evacuations, and truly save lives. The importance of space technology and space commerce in our lives has never been more evident than it is today. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for the opportunity to speak about the Department's progress. Thank you, Karen. Uh, th uh, thank you, Karen. Thank you so much uh, for your efforts, the Secretary's efforts. Uh, I, think, uh, I think everyone looking on can uh, see the energy with which the Department of Commerce uh, has engaged this uh, effort uh, to uh, streamline and to promote our commercial space industry and um, the administrative actions that you've outlined, the legislation that you're promoting, all are reflective of the President's uh, desire to uh, unleash the full potential of uh, our commercial uh, private sector. So thank you very much. Well done. With that, uh, let, me, uh, let me recognize our NASA Administrator uh, and to say to Administrator Bridenstine, we appreciate your leadership uh, at NASA. Um, we were all thankful to see uh, NASA astronaut Nick Haig return to the Earth uh, safely along with the Russian cosmonaut Alexei uh, Uchinin. Uchinin. Uh, we noted the failed rocket launch two weeks ago. Uh, I know you were in Kazakhstan for that launch. We spoke um, contemporaneous with that. Um, and uh, I appreciate the uh, attention that you paid to our uh, to our astronaut and to the entire uh, incident. It does strike me, uh, Jim, as a wake-up call uh, and the need for uh, us to once again be able to launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. And I know that day is rapidly approaching. Uh, so uh, uh, with that, uh, we look forward to your update uh, on uh, NASA's work with the Departments of Commerce and State, Transportation, uh, and also the uh, the status of the International Space Station. Uh, the, join me in welcoming the Administrator of, the, of NASA, Jim Bridenstine. Would you please? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Vice President. Um, it was a tough week uh, last week when, when we had a failed rocket launch. And as you correctly noted, uh, Nick Haig and Alexei Ovchinin are home safe. And we are very grateful for that. 
Uh, sir, I am also very grateful for your um, attention to the issue, your immediate care for the issue. Clearly, this is something that is important to you personally, um, and NASA recognizes that, and for that, we are all very grateful. I will tell you this, while our astronaut and their cosmonaut are home safe, they are not happy. They want to be on the International Space Station, and they cannot wait to go again. So we're grateful for their enthusiasm. Um, and NASA is regrouping, we're replanning, and we're getting ready to go again. We have a number of Russian Soyuz rocket launches in the next month and a half. And in December, we're fully anticipating putting our crew on a Russian Soyuz rocket to launch to the International Space Station again. We have a really, really good idea of what the issue is. Um, we are getting very close to understanding it even better so that we can confidently launch again. It is important to note um, that while this was a, a failed launch, it was probably the single most successful failed launch uh, that we could have imagined. So for all of that, we are grateful. As far as NASA goes, sir, we are moving out rapidly on Space Policy Directive 1. We are going to the moon. Uh, we are going in a sustainable way. We are not going to leave flags and footprints and come home not to go back for another 50 years. But um, under your guidance and the President's Space Policy Directive 1, we are building a reusable and a sustainable architecture. Secretary Chow very clearly articulated what happens with reusable launch. The cost goes down and access goes up. Well, we envision an architecture between here and the moon that is entirely reusable, not just launch to low Earth orbit, but tugs from Earth orbit to lunar orbit, and of course, the reusable command module in orbit around the moon, we call it gateway, and reusable landers that go back and forth from the gateway to the surface of the moon. And landers not just with robots and rovers, but eventually humans uh, in a sustainable architecture that takes advantage of our commercial partnerships and our international partnerships. Sir, last uh, two weeks ago, I was in Bremen, Germany for the International Astronautical Congress. I met with the heads of 24 different space agencies, and I had the opportunity to speak in front of international forums. And in each one, when I talked about the United States leading an international effort to get back to the moon, the response is overwhelming and it's spontaneous. People around the world have been waiting for the United States to get back to the moon and to lead a collaboration, much like we have done on the International Space Station, but to develop a much bigger and broader architecture to the moon, to retire risk, to prove technologies, to prove human physiology, and then take all of that architecture onto Mars. And I will tell you, in the international community, uh, it was very, very well received. People love Space Policy Directive 1, and sir, it makes my job really easy on the international scene. So thank you for that. Um, as it comes to the International Space Station and low Earth orbit, we are moving rapidly to commercialize low Earth orbit. Um, it is in our interest as a nation to, for NASA in low Earth orbit and other orbital regimes, for NASA to be one customer of many customers, driving down our cost, increasing our access, and not just be one customer of many customers, but have numerous providers that are competing on cost and innovation in a regulatory, a regulatory framework uh, that was articulated by Secretary Chow that enables us to do more than we've ever done before in low Earth orbit in a commercial way, and then we can use our resources to go where commercial industry is not yet ready. And of course, that's, um, that's to the moon with this sustainable architecture. So, w sir, we're moving out rapidly on these initiatives. Space Policy Directive 1 is kind of our bright, shiny object that we're going after. Space Policy Directive 2 on the regulatory frameworks, Space Policy Directive 3 on space situation awareness and space traffic management are all critical to our operations to accomplish these objectives. And it is also true that what we're talking about today, the Space Force, is critical to preserving all of these commercial and government capabilities for science, discovery, exploration, and of course, the betterment of humankind through commercial space activities. As you mentioned, sir, um, commerce requires security. When we came west, we needed to have security. When we do international trade, we have a navy because we need security. Um, and of course, this $383 billion industry that is in space is going to need security. 
The enemies of our country have identified space as the American Achilles heel. And we've got to make sure that they understand that they will receive no advantage from attempting to deny access to space for anybody in the world. And that would include civil space activities from NASA and NOAA, but also commercial space activities that uh, the Commerce Department and the Transportation Department are so focused on. So that's an update, sir, and I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for that uh, good report. Um, your energetic leadership is making a real difference uh, at NASA, and um, uh, I hope you will pass along our compliments to uh, uh, astronaut Nick Haig for being willing to get back on the horse. And, yes, sir. Uh, go right back up before Christmas. A courageous man. Five years in training, I'm sure he's anxious to get. To, to be up. clear, the mission before Christmas is not going to be Nick Haig, but he is anxious to get back there. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. bet he'll be crowding to the front of the line. <laughs> you bet. After talking with him. But, um, uh, great. Well done. Thank you very much. Thanks for your leadership. And, and thank you for uh, the way that NASA uh, is working in such close consultation with our, our efforts uh, in defense, our, our efforts in commercial space. Um, uh, it is, um, uh, it's, it's making a real difference. Uh, with that, uh, we're honored to be joined today by the chair of the Users Advisory Group, uh, which uh, the President appointed in connection with the National Space Council. It, it represents uh, some of uh, um, the leading um, experts on space, uh, men and women of extraordinary background um, who are uh, bringing their very best counsel uh, to the work of uh, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, national space effort. Admiral Jim Ellis uh, serves as the chair of that group. We're proud to have him here. And Admiral Ellis, uh, uh, you're recognized for a report on the work of the user advisory group. And uh, join me in thanking Admiral Ellis for this uh, latest chapter in his service uh, to the United States. Uh, we're grateful to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Vice President and distinguished members, uh, thanks for inviting me to provide an update on the activities of the Users Advisory Group to your National Space Council. The UAG convened its first session on June 19th of this year, just three days after the formal appointment of its members by the NASA Administrator. The establishment of the UAG was enabled by legislation enacted decades ago but you chose to revitalize it after 25 years of dormancy. Mr. Vice President, when we were last together, you challenged the UAG to function as a think tank for the National Space Council, in addition to the advisory role spelled out in its title. It is a conduit for new ideas and will also offer constructive commentary on conventional wisdom, which, as I often note, is sometimes too conventional and not nearly wise enough. In the months since our inaugural session, we've gathered often through the wonders of modern telecommunications technology and have focused on three principal areas, organization, issues, and outreach. Organizationally, the UAG is divided into six committees that reflect precisely the priorities you and I discussed in your office last spring. The Exploration and Discovery Committee is led by retired General Lester Lyles, and it's considering how to maintain a balance in space between exploration and discovery, or science. The alignment of science and technology efforts across federal agencies, and the impact of regulations and policies on the accomplishment of space policy directives one through three. Administrator Bridenstine has recently chartered a committee of the NASA Advisory Council to review regulatory and policy issues. The fact that General Lyles also chairs very capably the NASA Advisory Council will ensure that the UAG both shares in the work of the NASA committee and offers independent advice to you when appropriate. As you know, I am the chairman of the National Security Committee of the Users Advisory Group and lead a very capable group with the required security clearances. Though many of us gathered in this room have been assessing national security space, protection and defense for many years, 
The speed at which the technologies and the threats are continually evolving highlights the reality that they may outpace both our capabilities and our policies. A scheduled threat update is our committee's first priority, followed up by a review of emerging classified space capability enhancement and threat mitigation policies and strategies. An experienced and expert space professional, Mary Lynn Dittmar, and her talented colleague, Eric Stalmer, chair the Economic Development and Industrial Base Committee. They are considering recommendations for accelerating the economic development of low Earth orbit and the moon, developing a framework for understanding and applying the myriad contracting mechanisms, assessing how best to manage space-related spectrum issues, and expanding mechanisms encouraging use lease of available or mothballed government space infrastructure. Veteran astronaut and space shuttle pilot and mission commander Pam Melroy leads the Technology and Innovation Committee. In addition to specific space transportation and exploration technologies, the committee is assessing commercial versus government space data generation, satellite reusability and refueling, and importantly, the possible creation of a technology roadmap specifying space technologies to be explored, alternatives to be compared, and importantly, timelines that must be met. Eileen Collins, renowned four-time space shuttle pilot and mission commander, chairs the User Advisory Group Committee on Outreach and Education. I will say more about outreach efforts in a minute, but on the education side, our committee is committed to delivering actionable recommendations to enhance space-related and engineering education at all levels. Ideas include education incentive clauses in all space-related government contracts, incentivizing students to choose math, science, and engineering degrees by increasing individual grant money from existing programs, and innovative ways to address the high dropout rate of first-year engineering students. The final group, the Space Policy and International Engagement Committee, is led by Dr. David Wolf, astronaut, spacewalker, medical doctor, electrical engineer, and your fellow Hoosier. The committee's broad remit will include review of both the current and evolving national space policy, as well as the guidelines, behavioral norms, and technical standards affecting international space cooperation and deconfliction. Finally, as I noted earlier, mindful that we were impaneled to represent all users of space, the Users Advisory Group has conducted outreach panels at major domestic and international space events over several months. We will continue to seek input and ideas, issues and innovations, specifically targeting industry leadership, experienced aerospace veterans at all levels, and importantly, the up-and-coming new generation of space professionals. By way of example, Mary Lynn Dittmar and I met with a large group from the Space Generation Advisory Council earlier this month at the International Astronautical Congress in Bremen, Germany, where Administrator Bridenstein was also uh, speaking powerfully. The SGAC, the Space Generation Advisory Council, with over 13,000 members, represents the largest network of students, young professionals, and alumni in the global space industry. In a note of appreciation I received after our session, the organization's executive director said, the UAG is a perfect platform for us to provide an opportunity to our members to actively contribute to space-related activities and discussions. With that in mind, I'm also pleased to note that as of this past Friday, the Users Advisory Group has gone live with a hosted page under our NASA website where we can receive such input around the clock and from around the globe. Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the Users Advisory Group, thank you for this update opportunity. Wherever we go, at home or abroad, and with whomever we speak, we see a new energy, a new vitality in the space community. We appreciate the focus that you and the National Space Council have brought to our nation's role in space, and we look forward to continuing to support your efforts and to our shared contribution to the future of the nation's space enterprise. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Admiral Ellis, and uh, uh, we look forward to your recommendations from the User Advisory Group. Thank you to all of the members that you're leading in that energetic effort. Um, we are we have benefited greatly from the council, uh, the council's efforts so far, and we look forward uh, to your ongoing advice. Uh, I am told there's a fair number of members of the User Advisory Group who are with us. Would members of uh, the National Space Council's User Advisory Group stand so we could recognize you and uh, express our appreciation for uh, all you're doing for the country? Thank you, Admiral Ellis. And I'll, uh, uh, I'll invite our panelists to go ahead and take their seats. Um, um, and to uh, all of the uh, members of the National Space Council, in your packets for today's meeting, you have an agenda, uh, which includes a formal testimony of our panelists, a list of recommendations to the President regarding the creation of the Space Force, which uh, we will return to those items at, uh, at the end of uh, uh, the meeting. Um, our panel today is made up of distinguished experts in national security space policy and defense policy. Um, and as we look forward uh, to um, offering recommendations today uh, with the objective of standing up a sixth branch of our armed forces, um, uh, it is uh, our, our desire to draw on the experience of experts from across space and defense enterprises, and we have three uh, with us today. Our first panelist is uh, Doug. Uh, Lavero, a leader in uh, national security space policy and distinguished policy expert, served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense under President Obama. Uh, our second panelist is Mr. Mark uh, Sarangelo, who is currently the entrepreneur in residence at the University of Colorado Boulder, previously served as Executive Vice President at Sierra Nevada Corporation, where he led the company's space business. And our final panelist is Lieutenant General James McLaughlin. 35-year veteran of the United States Air Force, served as Deputy Commander of the United States Cyber Command. Um, and as, uh, as we move forward to standing up the United States Space Command, we need to draw on the valuable lessons we've learned from establishing the United States Cyber Command already. Um, so to uh, all three of our panelists, we are grateful uh, for your presence here today. And to the audience, join me in thanking this extraordinary group of Americans uh, for joining us here today. So, Mr. Doug Lavero, you're recognized to summarize your testimony, and I remind the members of the Council that their full testimony is in your packets. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, members of the National Space Council, ladies and gentlemen. Before I begin, I must apologize for my voice here today. I lost it due to sickness this past week. My lack of volume is due to the remnants of fever, not the absence of fervor. I am pleased to join Lieutenant General McLaughlin and Mr. Sarangelo to provide my perspectives on the need for a U.S. Space Force, a discussion long overdue. I especially want to thank President Trump for moving the debate onto the national stage. This is not a new subject. It's been talked about for decades inside the national space community. During my time at the Pentagon under the last administration, the need to rethink how DOD reorganizes space or organizes for space was a topic of considerable debate, but was left unresolved. So I'm particularly grateful that with the President's help, we can now bring the discussion into the public square to educate all Americans on why now is the time to act. To begin, I think it's important for me to describe the roots of my perspective. My discussion here today was not shaped in just the last few months as the topic was thrust into the news, nor over my prior four years in the Pentagon leading space policy. Rather, it is the sum of nearly 30 years of working continuously in national security space from within DOD and the intelligence community, in uniform and as a civilian from having been involved in every DOD space organizational debate since 1994, from working around the world with space-inclined allies and domestically with every segment of space industry, from defense contractors, from large defense contractors to small entrepreneurial firms, and with members of both parties. I would stop on this last item to make an important point. In my mind, how the DOD organizes for space is not a partisan issue, and it is my hope that it does not become one. Because if it does, and that causes us to fail to address it now, the next time we enter the discussion, U.S. leadership may have already been lost. With that as prelude, let me make it clear where I stand. The U.S. needs a space force. 
a department within the DOD whose sole focus is U.S. leadership in and defense of the domain of space. Time does not permit me in this short statement to describe all the reasons why, but that opinion is bolstered by every authoritative study external to DOD over multiple decades which has looked at these issues. Every one, every single one, points to the erosion of U.S. national security space leadership and the necessity to dramatically reorganize space within DOD. While they may differ on the exact form and timing of that reorganization, the unwavering consensus is that dramatic change is needed. In fact, even the Air Force Association, which opposes creation of a space force, admits, and I quote, standing up a new armed force for space is not if, but when. To that point, I think it's only appropriate to quote the words of General Hap Arnold, who founded the AFA and is viewed as the father of the modern Air Force. In his appearance before Congress in 1946 on the topic, he said, each new crisis has found our armed services far from effectively, efficiently, or economically organized. With each crisis, modernization and coordination have been hammered out under war pressure at great waste of resources. Last century's two world wars found the U.S. inadequately organized for the air domain. Luckily, the constraints of distance and speed in 1917 and 1941 allowed the U.S. to hammer out U.S. air power organization in time to respond. But General Arnold knew then, as we know now, that future wars will broker no such quarter. Historical limits on distance and speed do not apply in a world of hypersonic weapons and instantaneous worldwide communication. An unimaginable level of U.S. military power derives from space. We cannot afford to enter into the next conflict, to use General Arnold's words, ineffectively or inefficiently organized. The time to address the issue is now, while we are at peace, not later, when the adversary has already gained the upper hand. With that, I conclude my opening remarks and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Doug. I look forward to coming back with you uh, with a couple of questions on your uh, very, very insightful uh, and provocative uh, remarks. And uh, thank you for braving the fever to share your fervor. Uh, we appreciate, uh, appreciate you making the effort to be here under the circumstances. Uh, Mark uh, Serangelo uh, is recognized, and we're, and we're very grateful for your presence today. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, members of the Space Council. I'm honored to be asked to speak today at the, on the creation of the Space Force. What follows are my own personal views, not of any organization, and I have been part of. Over the past few two decades, I've had the privilege to be part of and led organizations that have done over 300 space missions, which combined with the time that I have spent in the government, military, and industry associations, and now academia, has provided me with some unique insights into the creation of a space force. So I'm going to focus my remarks today on the why, but not the how. The United States is fortunate to have a storied space history. We have the most advanced space technologies, the largest space budgets, a commercial space sector that is innovating and investing, strong government leadership, universities and laboratories producing valuable primary results and research, and above all, talented people in and out of uniform who have created a space infrastructure that has no global equal. It was once famously said that it is in our DNA to do things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Being at the forefront of space leadership is hard. Testing new ideas and surviving through failure is hard. And as I've learned recently, teaching 100 students is really hard. Perhaps the hardest thing to do, though, sometimes is to be self-critical. We must be completely honest with ourselves in reviewing our decisions, both past and future. We must put aside the pride of ownership and self-interest and change when change is necessary. So here are a few frank views of, of my own on this situation. Yes, we are currently, as in the United States, at the forefront of space development, but there's no guarantee that we're going to remain in, in, in front. Our adversaries have been for a considerable time increasing their space resources on all levels. And it, to, dimin to, dimis uh, to dimin uh, diminish this or dismiss their efforts as minor is really short-sighted. We cannot simply ignore this changing global environment and we must use significant determination to accelerate our response. Undertaking the extraordinary effort of consolidating our national space defense activities under a common banner is one way to send a very blunt message to the world that we are serious. We as a nation achieve our best results when we are unified, when we are focused on the primary problem, 
when we are passionate in our responses, when we establish a competitive environment for solutions, and when we apply innovation not just to technology, but also to our thinking. We've seen this innovative thinking applied time and again in American aerospace. At the dawn of flight, the U.S. encouraged the development of an aviation industry and chose not to have government ownership of aviation, as did most other countries of the world. This led to having, us having aviation as one of the top economic pillars for the last 100 years. The lessons learned from World War II provided that air power should be one of the most important drivers of our national defense. This led to the creation of the U.S. Air Force in 1947. We responded to Sputnik and to losing ground in the space race by unifying ourselves around a complete transformation of our space efforts, leading not only to our celebrated journey to the moon, but also, as importantly, to the creation of our space industrial base, a strong NASA, and global recognition of our technical prowess. Recently, we've acted to, reacted to the shifting ways and means of space by encouraging a new commercial space sector focusing on public-private partnerships. This has allowed hundreds of American technologies to flourish and create beneficial competition throughout the country. Re our reliance on space assets is growing exponentially in all ways. Its increasing importance to our country cannot be denied. This importance will not diminish and will only continue to expand. And the challenge we face is not going to become easier, it's not going to become cheaper, it's not going to become less complex or less important in the future. And at this crossroad, there is little to gain, in my view, from taking any middle position. We must do or not do. The question is not what's right for the next decade, but what's right for the next century. Those of us who work in the space sector really understand that what we do is really the long term, is for the long term. And we are only really just interim custodians for what happens here. What we do now and how we do it will, will vibrate well into the future. We have had significant success from our space structure. We owe a debt of gratitude to all those who sacrificed to get here. We owe it to them to use what they have used and wisely. And our job as leaders is to hear all points of view and to have the wisdom and the judgment to come to informed and balanced decisions. As we go down this road of looking at a space force, this change must be more than just a paper reorg. It must be real, it must be fundamental, and it must be something that we can plan for for the future. People often look at technology fields such as space and the industry that I've been in for in the last two decades, and they look at the hardware and not really what's behind it. The reality is that we're only as good as the people we have on our front lines. We need to keep them engaged by, by creating strong, strong career paths here. A dedicated space force will likely increase retention by creating more and, and more interesting long-term opportunities for high performers. We'll be able to attract, uh, to attract the best and brightest to, in the future to the DOD if they see a robust long-term commitment being made by our government. And last but not least, the space is not is a large ecosystem. As we consider this change to be successful, we must look at elements beyond the DOD. We need to ensure that NASA remains strong, well-funded, and independent as our civil agency. We need to, cons to continue to support the U.S. commercial space industry's investment in technology. We need to incorporate our universities through the support of STEM education and future primary research. This will provide motivation to the next generations while pursuing space studies and concurrently increasing the future talent pipeline for the DOD. We need to fully utilize the substantial and critical work that's being done on our national laboratories. And finally, we need to remember that space is more international than ever before. When practical and feasible, we should cooperate with our allies. Multinational space activities have been successful for the U.S. in the past, and they will be in the future. I'd like to close. Uh, sometimes, as I look at important decisions, one of the things that I like to do is to uh, remember my trip to the National Archives. When you go up to the National Archives, as you walk through the door, there's a Shakespearean quote on a statue that says, what is past is prologue. And with that quote, I'd like to end with just a, a little bit of walk into the past, if I may. In 1937, uh, the Bible for aviation was called the Aircraft Yearbook. And there's a quote out of this that I think is very important and perhaps insightful for today. Most significant of all in a situation that defies any sort of restraint in describing it is the breakneck race of all other large nations for military supremacy in the air. The American people have taken real pride in the success which they have developed the airplane as a vehicle of peaceful transportation. They have always preferred that kind of development as compared to making the flying machine an instrument of war, and there's no indication that that national thought has changed. 
On the other hand, the present activity abroad is predominantly military and is growing so rapidly that it can no longer be ignored. Our adversaries are, growing, are going into mass production of military aircraft as rapidly as facilities permit. These fa their factories are operating day and night. In the laboratories and drafting rooms, their scientists and technicians feverishly work on new things designed for aerial warfare. Many of these developments abroad seem fantastic and more of a stunt, but in aviation, the stunt flight of today seems bound to be commonplace tomorrow. The powers abroad are spending untold amount of money on research and development, but they are not just waiting for new things to be created. They're building quantities of these machines based on American aircraft operated in the United States. The laboratory work in progress surely will also result in much originality of design and construction. Therein lies the, the possible menace to American leadership. They are now making up for lost time. The United States is not spending fund money, enough money fund on fundamental research. While the superiority of American equipment is currently unquestioned at present, it is being challenged by the scientific efforts of other powers. Americans returning from abroad are convinced that the national thought as to safety from invasion must change. Whether or not the people in the United States like it or not, they must, they must take care that foreign nations do not surpass them in the development of air power. If we substitute space for air in those words from 1937, they're just as valid today as they were then. We know what happened to the world a few years after that all happened. We must use all possible efforts to avoid it. Does it not happen again? Thank you for letting me address the council. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you for those uh, eloquent words. We look forward to coming back to you with uh, some uh, questions with that. Uh, the uh, uh, former Deputy Commander of the United States Cyber Command, Lieutenant uh, General James McLaughlin, is recognized. Us. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, Vice President Pence, members of the National Space Council, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to join these two distinguished panelists to discuss the President's proposal to create a Space Force. I have a unique perspective on the topic of how the government should organize and, tr uh, and manage national security space. You can see from my biography that I spent the majority of my 34-year career in a variety of space assignments that are relative uh, to today's discussion. I resonated with your opening comments. I'm very proud of my service in the Air Force and what uh, our service has done and the legacy we have in space. But my perspective today really is on the challenges that are now and, the, and some of the challenges that have been on our plate going back to the time of the Rumsfeld Space Commission where I served as a staff member and was later responsible within the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Space Commission implementation to the Deputy Secretary of Defense. I have firsthand knowledge of what the Commission recommended and why, as well as what was and what was not implemented. I'm here representing myself and have no personal or business interest in the outcome of this debate other than wanting what's best for the United States. The Space Commission was tasked, among other things, to assess the potential costs and benefits of establishing a separate military department for space, a space core within the United States Air Force, and an assistant secretary of defense for space within the office of the secretary of defense. However, after six months of del deliberations, the Commission did not recommend an immediate move toward a department or a core, but instead recommended an internal Air Force realignment aimed at creating a separate structure within the Air Force with control over space, organized, trained, and equipped functions such as personnel management and policy, financial management, research and development, and the planning, programming, and acquisition of space systems. The Commission stated that once the realignment in the Air Force was complete, a logical step towards a space department could be the transition to a space corps within the Air Force. The Commission also recommended the creation of a new Undersecretary of Defense for space that would actually oversee and advocate for this missionary within the department. So what happened and where are we today? I'm disappointed to say that we missed a generational opportunity. We did not implement the realignment of the Air Force as envisioned by the Space Commission, and we did not create a strong OSD oversight mechanism. We never started the journey towards a core or, de or a department. We missed the opportunity identified by the Commission to, quote, create a space-oriented culture comprised of military professionals who would directly influence the development of the systems and doctrines for use in space operations, end quote. While it would be untrue and unfair to say we've not made progress in national security space, because that's not true, we uh, have made progress that's actually well short of what's needed. 
I do have some recommendations moving forward for the council's consideration. To the degree it's possible, I would, I would strive to maintain the extraordinary level of presidential focus and leadership, uh, which has been extraordinary, and to continue to build consensus on the Hill. Do everything possible to make this a bipartisan issue that resonates as explained to and important to all Americans. Don't be distracted by issues that may seem important to this issue, but are actually not central to the problem, or you may end up being disruptive in the wrong areas. Don't believe that creating an independent organization would distract us from urgent problems of the day. Because creating the space personnel culture, doctrine, and capabilities the nation needs in space is the urgent problem of the day. Focus on rapid results and momentum. Pick an independent organizational structure. Align it under a single committed senior space leader. Provide that leader the needed authority, autonomy, and resources over those core space organized, trained, equipped functions. A separate Space Corps within the Department of the Air Force may be viewed as the most efficient and cheapest path to a separate branch of the military. But a Space Force under a separate Department of Space would be, in my opinion, the most rapid and most effective path toward an organization able to meet the serious threats that exist right now, not tomorrow or in the midterm. And last, I would create and assign a single senior OSD official with the responsibility to provide oversight advocacy, top cover for this new organization, and to ensure all actions are being implemented as directed. I do think it's worth mentioning that in my last uh, four years of the, in the Air Force, I actually was over working in a similar set of problems in the cyber area, both as the Air Force component commander for cyber and then three years as the deputy at U.S. Cyber Command. Uh, it is interesting that we took a very different path in this, in this pace, but against many of the same problems, and I think in some ways has not been as controversial, although there are still hard problems to come, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you have regarding that experience. And in summary, the purpose of my remarks today is not to be critical of any individual organization at all, but to simply share the benefits of my experience, provide a candid view of the history associated with this important area, and provide some recommendations to spark a discussion. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, General, and uh, uh, we'll move into uh, questions from a few of uh, the members of the Council uh, for the panelists. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and excuse the uh, Secretary of Transportation. She has to uh, uh, introduce the President uh, shortly, and uh, we'll just allow you to thank step you so aside. Much. Um, join me in thanking Secretary Chow. Would you please for a job well done? Let me begin, um, uh, Doug Lavero and and, uh, uh, and and General McLaughlin. You just you spoke about um, uh, the importance of, uh, of of the president placing this issue at the center uh, of the national debate. Doug, you, you you made some very generous comments about that, and in, in setting up your statement that the U.S. needs a space force. Um, in, in what ways, and maybe I'll start with Doug and go to the general, and uh, Mark, you can speak to this, uh, and keep your answers maybe to a minute if you can, because I want to get to everybody. Um, how would you best recommend that the president and the administration keep this issue before the American people most, uh, most effectively? Thank you, sir. Um, so, first of all, this kind of a forum is obviously part of that of that effort. Um, we uh, we have a, um, a an issue within the U.S. in my mind that everybody uses space every day, but almost nobody really knows how it gets there and why it's important. Um, I I think that um, that NASA um, does a fantastic job of educating um, the country on civil space. Uh, we do a far um, a far less job of educating on the military uses of space. If people understood that military space saves lives, it saves U.S. lives, it saves our allies' lives, it saves our adversaries' lives, it saves our treasure, um, I think that these points need to be brought out to the public so they can understand that this is not just a lark or a late-night joke. 
Um, this is an important critical issue for the U.S. Uh, and the more, we, the more we educate folks on this, uh, the more they will go ahead and I believe support um, the move because they'll understand, as all Americans did after World War II, they understood the importance of the Air Force. They saw it. They lived it. We don't have that same understanding about space today. So I would love to see that happen. Yeah, very well said. General? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, two things very quick. I do think if you even go back to the Space Commission, which I, I, I mentioned earlier, the first three recommendations of the 13 had to do with presidential leadership and some structure and coordinating structure within the, right. within the executive office of the president. And at a time we were trying to talk about such significant changes in the executive branch, and I would say today, the lack of, that didn't really happen for a lot of, a lot of good reasons, but it, it didn't happen. So I, I do think the leadership itself on something this big with, without it, uh, the likelihood of it stalling or not being implemented r rises without the president, you know, without that vocal uh, leadership. I, the only thing I would suggest is I, I think the fact that it's mentioned so much and we have the National Space Council that's active and public is just continuing to explain sort of in the English my mom and dad would understand as to why this is so important to the American people in a way that I think would resonate with their representatives in Congress and so that they would understand why this we need to make these changes uh, that would res resonate with them is just I, I think we're doing that but I would encourage that to be done uh, even more so. Good. Uh, very helpful. Uh, Mark? Thoughts? Yes, sir. I would, uh, two things. I, I think one of the exercises that I've been involved with in the past was an internal one called a day without space. I think if we took that concept of a day without space and brought it out to make it a publicly accessible understanding of a, what is a day without space, what would that look like? How would we live? It's not just what we do in the military and what we've done within the government, but it's what we do every day in our lives. I think that simple concept, if we, t we go to a person and say, what would space, if we took it away from you today, what would that look like? I think that is a way to get to. And as I agree with my colleagues, I would also add one thing that while I would want my mom and dad to understand it, I would also want the next generation to understand. And I think we need to bring this to a language that not only looks at the people who are there right now making decisions, but who, is, who we're going to hand this off to in the next 10, 20, and 30 years and make them understand from their fundamental way as they understand their own ways of video games and their own way of language and their own way of social media, bring it into that context. Thank you. Uh, that, that's uh, great and very provocative. Uh, Jim, we ought to come back to that day without space concept for school kids. Uh, it's pretty powerful. Um, um, how, quickly, uh, how quickly we would lose a lot of the things that we all rely on every day. Um, let alone the things that our national security relies upon. So, uh, good comments. Uh, with that, uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense Shanahan. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, question for uh, General McLaughlin, and first of all, thank you for your service. You know, having uh, been part of the Rumsfeld Commission and then certainly, you know, deep involvement with the uh, Cyber Command, when you think about, you know, we're going to undertake a very similar type of mission, what would be your lessons learned or thinking around how to focus people on quick wins and to uh, you know, get the reps so that you get the energy and the um, momentum that's needed to establish something new? Yes, that's a great question. I think where there is a tie the, the, between the two communities, you know, the space community that I grew up in was, while they're very good at their job, they really are about providing sort of a service, providing, you know, operating satellites that are utilities or space support for launch, doing, you know, the, the intelligence mission from space, but not having to actively engage and fight in that space. Mm -hmm. Same thing in the cyber side is the, the building blocks of the cyber warfare community are sort of our communications and our intelligence professionals who also had a different, a, a different mission before. So our job and what I think we did pretty well on the cyber side is we created U.S. Cyber Command from the very beginning. This is a military operations force. This is a domain of warfare. We have active offensive teams that we stated publicly to the world, and we are building the ethos for those operators to be cyber warriors. And I think going back 20 years, that's what journey that I wish we would have started on in earnest in the space side 20 years ago, because it creates that ethos and doctor, it creates just the entire group that feels like that's the mission and the purpose for why they exist. And I, I think that would be something we would want to focus on uh, in a serious way. Thank you very much.
With that, let me recognize the Under Secretary of State, Andrea Thompson, for a question. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, for the panel, I'd be interested, obviously, over at the State Department, we're in continuous dialogue with partners on allies on, uh, on policies that we're, that we're moving forward together. And one of that is of norms of behavior for responsible nation states. I'd be interested on recommendations that you'd recommend that we pursue uh, with partners on allies to prevent uh, the activities of space from becoming an area of conflict uh, and rather engagement in diplomacy and sharing those best practices to open to the panel. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ma'am, I'll begin. Thank you. Um, I spent a lot of time in my last job talking about just those things uh, with your uh, with your folks in the State Department and with our allies all over the world. Uh, norms of behavior are critical. Um, they, we have norms of behavior in every domain that are well known, whether they're written in law or not. Um, we have norms of behavior on the use of certain kinds of weapons in every domain, whether they're written in law or not. We lack that in space for many reasons, most of which because for decades space was classified. Um, we didn't want to go ahead and talk about limits in our space capability. And a lot of that traces back to the fact that we don't know what our space doctrine is. And if we don't know what our space doctrine is, we're not sure what we should tell and what we shouldn't tell. Um, I believe a huge part of this um, for a space force is to develop doctrine that can shape the norms that advantage the United States and our allies in space. Um, I've written several things on, on this. Um, I think debris causing weapons in space is a terrible thing. Um, the, uh, the international outcry when the Chinese shot down their weather satellite uh, was enough to make them stop doing it ever again. But we haven't promulgated a norm like that in the same way we've promulgated norms about landmines and um, mass bombardment, easy enough to do. We would, get, uh, we would be seen as a leader instead of playing the defense on norms in space, which is where we are today. We could go ahead and lead again, as we did back in 67 with the Outer Space Treaty. Thank you for the question, ma'am. Uh, I would look at this a little bit uh, differently in saying that while we look at space sometimes as we have looked at airplanes and defense, it is many ways more like the IT industry right now. And what I mean by that is that it is globalizing at a rate that we cannot control. And whether or not we like it, countries around the world are being not only active, but in many ways leading in certain areas. So I think as we look at this, we, you know, we might take a lesson out of that book and say, why is the world largely on an IT standard that has come out of the United States? It's because that we approached it, we led it, we created a forum for these discussions to take place. And we were able to bring countries to us in a voluntary way to say that we are the leader in what we're doing. And I think in part my experience of reaching out and establishing relationships with over 20 different space agencies, not for the purpose of using their money, but for the purpose of being able to provide a dialogue that would allow for the globalization of space not to take place somewhere else, which is, I think, our goal. So coming back to the IT example, the reason that the world uses that is because that IT structure, those infrastructures, those recommendations, the way we do things, the reason we have USBs, all came from the minds that largely were here in the United States and then were brought out to the world. And I think we should see space in that kind of context as opposed to, as Doug said, a closed classified context. Thank you. Maybe just to add to your question, I, I think in these areas like space or cyber where perhaps there's not those mature uh, sets of norms and the frameworks associated with them, uh, what I typically would fall back on is uh, every operation we conduct in the military that, uh, that is you know, authorized by Secretary of Defense and by the President before that follows international law of armed conflict. You know, we, we, we follow the law in everything that we do. Uh, and we follow the policy of our country and all those things. And so the question is, what are, are there a set of norms or red lines or things that might help shape uh, and give confidence in the broader community about what the United States will or won't do? And I think we will defend ourselves, uh, not violating laws of armed conflict, but we will defend ourselves in ways that others might think is provocative. Uh, we will not, we, our goal is to not have uh, vacuums created by lack of action that actually incentivize those to attack us in space because we have not paid attention to it, which actually creates a negative, uh, something that we don't want. So I think there are ways to approach how you think through that, but I do think, as Doug, I agree with everything that's been said by the two panelists next to me, uh, thinking about those norms and actually think about what is bad behavior that we would want 
uh, all to agree not to do is worth doing, but we just need to be careful to make sure we always are able to defend ourselves. Great. Thank you all. Um, and uh, General Paul Selva, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, to all three panelists, just uh, sort of a two-part question. The first is um, to get your reflections on how you think the combatant command, U.S. Space Command, would operate in relation to a separate service, the U.S. Space Force. And then second, inside the department, if we were to establish a separate undersecretary for space within the Department of Defense at the same time that we established a Department of the Space Force, could you give me a sense of how you see those two entities re interacting with one another? Yes, sir, that's a, a great question. Uh, I think the first thing, if I were to think about a Department of Space and U.S. Space Command, uh, I have heard some areas where it sounded a little confusing to me as to whether U.S. Space Command would be uh, a functional combatant command that also has some service-like responsibilities, sort of like SOCOM and, and like Cyber Command is, is slightly morphing to, which would make you think, well, why do I need a service that does that? So I first would delineate, is this a functional combatant command that, that fights on behalf of the country and, uh, and the service that we create is in charge of presenting organized training equip and presenting forces to that, which is more traditional. Which, and that's the way I would go with it, because I, I think you undermine the need for a department if you try to create a, a, a combatant command with service-like authorities, because it creates confusion. Uh, the ASD space, uh, even as a cyber guy, I would have loved to have had a single focused OSD oversight office, sort of like ASD special operations and low intensity conflict, where I got, where I got focused oversight with expertise on everything that we did. I do think an ASD space could do that effectively for a military department, as well as you know, as in the OST's responsibility to oversee combat, you know, uh, combat command operations. So I see them sort of as these two, these three entities, really as complementary organizations that all need to exist. But we need, to, we I would recommend that we be careful not to give them overlapping or la a lack of clarity what the edges are between them. Thank you, sir. Um, so, uh, number one, I agree with uh, with much of what uh, Kevin has said. Let me uh, let me take each question individually. On the uh, on the difference between the combatant command and the organized training and equip for a space force, as you know, um, those are two separate functions throughout the DoD. One of the one of the things that, as I was in the Pentagon, uh, that I looked at is that we didn't have a dedicated organization that looked at war planning and strategy formation in space. That's the job of a unified command. Um, strategic command, which owned that responsibility, was unfortunately distracted by more important things, nuclear war. Um, and so I, I understood um, that we needed that capability. But the unified command is not going to go ahead and, um, and organize, train, and equip space forces. And to Mr. Sierangelo's uh, point, space personnel and space professionals. That's a career-long objective. Um, one that is critically important to having the right forces. Now, I could easily see in 10 years we might decide that rather than a unified, we would have a specified command dependent upon how we organized a space force. Today, though, given where space exists within the department, in the Army, in the Navy, in the National Reconnaissance Office, in the Missile Defense Agency, and within a, the Air Force, um, a unified command is necessary. Um, and we'll have to decide whether it continues to be necessary as a space force reaches its potential. In terms of an assistant secretary, I believe um, the appointment of an assistant secretary for space over the next two to three years is absolutely fundamental to getting this job done. After that, I could easily see that space responsibility falls under a single undersecretary that may or may not need an assistant secretary for space. In the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, there was always one undersecretary of the department who led space in the 60s and 70s and early 80s, the, the DDRNE, and in the 80s and in the, in, in the interim years between 1996 and 2001, uh, the ASDC-3I. Um, you had to go to one person to, in OSD to get permission to do something in space, and incredible things were done. If you really want to go ahead and get speed, you need a decision maker who can say yes or no to a service when a service brings forward something. 
Again, in the long term, you may not need a specific assistant secretary. It may fall under a undersecretary as one of his duties. But I definitely believe to, to get the President's vision done over the next two to three years, you're going to need somebody focused on this problem. Sir, I agree with my panelists, but I would add, also add two things. One is that uh, after the uh, spending 300 or so space missions, one of the things that you come to realize is how rapidly space technology is advancing. I think the purpose of having a unified command is not just for, for the administrative side or the operational side, it's also because we live in an environment where, where those decisions are going to be happening at a speed and an in increasing speed that we have not seen before. And I think having that unified command would allow that to happen. I think it also would provide a, a unified front to the industrial base that has to work with this organization. Uh, we are spending considerable on our resources, and some of that resources is spent on redundancy. And I think as we do this, we have to look forward also to the budgeting process and say that make sure that we use that money as wisely as possible in, in a unified command. I think that will happen. As in any command, having a under uh, assistant secretary, as Doug said, I think is required for the short term. Decisions have to be made. They have to be made rapidly, and it has to be made by someone who has the power to make them. And I think that is the only way to stand this up and also to reflect externally to the United States that we are serious about what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, maybe our last question for the panel from uh, our NASA administrator. Jim. Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to, uh, to say, uh, Doug, you have been a champion on this issue for a very long time. And as a former member of the House of Representatives, Mr. Vice President, you should know that we've had the opportunity to vote on what was called the Space Corps, which wasn't a fully, it wasn't a full new service, but like the Marine Corps is part of the Department of the Navy, the Space Corps would be part of the Department of the Air Force. And in that vote, we had 344 yes votes as part of the National Defense Authorization Act in the House of Representatives. Strong bipartisan support. I voted on it as a member of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. I voted on it as a member of the Full Armed Services Committee. Both cases, strong bipartisan support. And then, of course, in the House of Representatives, it got 344 votes. In no small part, Doug, because of your leadership. Because you were committed, and I heard you in your testimony, I read your testimony as well. The, the point here is that this cannot and must not become a partisan issue. Um, and you've been committed to that from the beginning, and I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Finally, I, in your testimony, Doug, I read um, that one of the things that you suggest, and, and I've heard this before, that because there's no space doctrine, we shouldn't have a space force because we're not ready for it. And of course, your testimony, and you've said it verbally, is that, wait a second, we need a space force so we can have a space doctrine. Um, so I think that's a, an, an, a very important point to make. And finally, um, when we think about the history here, uh, you've mentioned Hap Arnold, of course a critically important person in the history of the creation of the Air Force. Before him was Billy Mitchell. And Billy Mitchell was a Brigadier General. He became very strong advocate for a separate independent Air Force after World War I. He was such a strong advocate at a time when a lot of the political leadership wasn't ready, he eventually got fired. It is also true that when we started flying missions in World War II from aircraft carriers, we had Air Force bombers on aircraft carriers. Those B-25 bombers were called the Mitchell, the B-25 Mitchell. So when you look through the history, um, there have been visionaries that got dismissed and eventually they were proven correct. And Doug, I think you're one of those people. And I just want to make sure that's on the record. Sir, uh, thank you very much. It's, it's been a pleasure to work with you over these years on this important topic. And I, 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 want, I need to say two things. First, I need to talk about Captain Paul Beck. Nobody here has ever heard of Captain Paul Beck. But Captain Paul Beck was actually the first advocate for a separate Air Force. Um, in 1913, he was the only uniformed member of the Air Service um, going ahead and testifying for it at a time when Billy Mitchell, Hap Arnold, and Benjamin Follet testified against it. You've never heard of Captain Paul Beck. 
because he was caught in a liaison with the wife of the Supreme Court Justice of Oklahoma and was shot. Um, so I hope I do not meet that fate. So, um, so um, but to your point, um, doctrine is just about everything. Doctrine dictates what we buy, how we train, how we plan, how we go ahead and develop um, our space forces. Today we don't have a space doctrine because doctrine is developed by domain services. Now, it's untrue to say there's not a document called space doctrine. The land doctrine is developed by the Army. Naval doctrine is developed by the Navy. Air doctrine by the Air Force. But our space doctrine is developed by the Joint Staff. Um, and it's more a command and control relationship document than a doc doctrine of how we fight. People have asked for decades, who's the Mahan for space? Who's the Clausewitz for space? We have no answer. We are not going to get there without a service that goes ahead and promulgates and promotes those people who can think in that way. Thank you. Well, uh, I want to invite everyone to thank this extraordinary panel for their contributions to uh, this meeting and their contributions to the life of the nation. Thank you very much. Well done. Uh, with that, we're going to open the floor for a discussion uh, about the United States Space Force and the recommendations that uh, will be proposed uh, for the President um, at the close of this meeting. I'm going to ask the members of the National Space uh, Council to approve those proposals shortly, but um, uh, the, the public uh, should know that members of uh, this Council have been deeply involved in interagency discussions regarding the Space Force, and um, uh, several have asked for the opportunity to provide public remarks at this time. So in the interest of transparency and uh, keeping the public fully informed uh, about this process, uh, I wanted to make sure um, uh, several of our members had an opportunity. I would say to all the members, if you want to submit written remarks uh, for the record uh, for public inspection as well, you're entitled uh, to do that. Um, let me, uh, let me begin with uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense Patrick Shanahan, and again, thank you, uh, Patrick, for your uh, 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 great leadership uh, at the Pentagon in, in, uh, in moving uh, President Trump's vision uh, for a Space Force great. forward. Good. Thank you, sir. It's great to be here with all of you, and I'd have to say we've come a long way since our inaugural Space Council meeting a year ago. And before making some remarks, I thought I'd uh, give out a a few thank yous. So Mr. Vice President, thank you for your leadership, for your drive, and for your impatience. Yeah. We have to go fast. Sue, thank you for your working together spirit and forward thinking. And Secretary Wilson, I greatly appreciate your teamwork and your commitment to getting things right. General Selva, I can't think of a better partner. Your expertise and focus on the warfighter and technical prowess is unmatched. Dr. Scott Pace, I appreciate you making sure there is no daylight between our operations. And there's Russ. Russ, thank you for your fiscal stewardship. It's, also, it's always helpful to restate. That's, that's a great list. Yeah, I'd like to join you. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. It's always helpful to restate the reason we are here. The U.S. military is the best in the world in space, but our adversaries have taken note and are actively developing and fielding capabilities to potentially deny our usage of space in crisis or war. At the same time, commercial space industry has moved forward in ways never imagined. President Trump has directed that a response to the threats from adversaries and the opportunities of commercial space be combined to generate a solution, the Space Force. The creation of the Space Force is no easy task, as I've come to learn firsthand. Mr. Vice President, we're moving out. We owe... Thank you. Thank you. We owe a legislative proposal in the coming weeks. That's a significant lift. 
The legislative proposal will embody our guiding principles, speed and effectiveness. Speed in leveraging commercial space technology and resources. Speed in escaping red tape. Speed in fielding capability sooner. It will reflect our drive to be more effective. Effective in maximizing how we are more integrated technically to unlock our ability to be united in our space operations. Effective in creating a solution and then together, not singularly, leveraging the solutions across the enterprise. Effective in how we structure the Space Force. Cost is not an independent variable. We must demonstrate prudence and create value. Our most pressing focus is the construction of the Space Development Agency. We are defining the statement of work, the resources, the mix of talent, and many other critical attributes. The Space Development Agency will leverage technology, standards, and architecture to enable unparalleled integration. The technical foundation must be provisioned for growth and new missions. The effort now is on reconciling capabilities prioritized by the National Defense Strategy with the readiness of technology, anchored by our assumptions on how quickly we can scale. Very, very smart technical leaders are focused on this effort. This will lead to a budget proposal outlining both how we will stand up the Space Force and what new warfighting capabilities we need to ensure our dominance in space. In conclusion, Mr. Vice President, I appreciate your steady hand in driving the President's vision into reality. The Department of Defense is moving out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, the uh, chair recognizes the uh, principal deputy director of national intelligence, uh, a, a woman that uh, the president and I have come to respect so greatly for her, uh, her uh, role in uh, uh, the life of the nation, for her steady counsel. Uh, join me in, in uh, thanking Sue Gordon uh, for her great leadership and presence here today. Mr. Vice President, uh, thank you for your steady leadership of the Council and for your work to elevate American preeminence in space as a national priority. I am absolutely delighted to be here representing the women and men of the intelligence community, uh, and I'm honored to be in the presence of such uh, distinguished colleagues uh, who share in this vital quest. And to Doug, Mark, and Kevin, uh, to have your voices lent uh, to this endeavor gives me great confidence, so thank you very much. Um, the intelligence community applauds the redoubled emphasis on ensuring and protecting our, our strategic advantage in this domain that is so necessary to our national interests. But it's a strategic advantage that our adversaries and competitors would seek to diminish. We assess that Russia and China continue to focus on establishing operational forces designed to attack United States space systems. Space is a priority warfighting domain for them, as demonstrated by the creation of dedicated military space organizations over the past several years. Russian and Chinese destructive anti-satellite weapons will probably reach an SLA operating capability in the next few years. And both these countries are advancing directed energy weapons technologies for the purpose of fielding anti-satellite weapons that could blind or damage or our sensitive space-based optical sensors, such as those used for remote sensing or missile defense. And in addition, Russia and China continue to launch experimental satellites that conduct sophisticated on-orbit activities, at least some of which are intended to advance counterspace capabilities. If a future conflict were to occur involving Russia or China, either country would probably justify attacks against U.S. and allied satellites as necessary to offset any perceived U.S. military advantage derived from military, civil, or commercial space systems. Now, President Trump's national strategy for space recognizes that our competitors and adversaries have turned space into a warfighting domain. 
The development of a Space Force is necessary to counter these adversarial actions that would deny the President's objective, which is simply that the United States must maintain its leadership, its preeminence, and freedom of action in space. I want to assure the Space Council members and the public that in the face of emerging threats, the intelligence community and the Department of Defense have not been idle. We are not well designed for waiting. Together we have created common mechanisms for collaboration that have greatly improved unity of effort and have vastly improved our effectiveness in space. More, I'm working closely with the Deputy Secretary Shanahan and Vice Chairman Selva to ensure that the intelligence community and the department are even better positioned and aligned as we move forward for delivering outcome. Simply put, the intelligence community is leading in in the development of the Space Force and building aggressively on our storied past. The Na President's National Strategy for Space requires the intelligence community to work hand in glove with the DOD on four key areas that are vital to the mission of the Space Force. First, we are jointly working to accelerate the transformation of our space architecture to enhance resiliency, defenses, and responsiveness to mission needs. Second, we are working to strengthen our deterrence and warfighting options. The intelligence community is pursuing with the Department of Defense ways to strengthen U.S. and allied efforts to deter potential adversaries from extending conflict into space. And if deterrence fails to counter threats, used by those adversaries for hostile actions. Third, we are working to improve our foundational capabilities, structures, and processes. I've directed elements of the intelligence community to work with the Air Force and the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering and other key Space Force stakeholders to accelerate collaboration on the development of cutting-edge capabilities that will ensure effective space operations through, insured, through improved situational awareness, intelligence, and acquisition processes. And finally, we are directly supporting the space warfighter by providing unique, actionable intelligence, and by having our analysts and operators co-located with the Joint Space Command compo Component Commander, to, where they share the floor to make sure that we act as one. This allows us to jointly test new approaches to space operations, and when those operations demonstrate merit, we will work to jointly field new capabilities. Mr. Vice President, members of the Council, since 1961, the intelligence community has been invested in space, supporting exploration, reconnaissance, and defense in, from, and to, through this domain. I appreciate the opportunity to describe how the intelligence community is working to advance the establishment of the Space Force and the opportunity it provides. I look forward to updating the Council as our work progresses. Now, let us be up and doing. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Sue. Thank you uh, for your energetic collaboration uh, on this effort uh, between defense uh, and the intelligence community. Uh, you have most certainly, as evidenced by both of your <laughs> remarks today, you've certainly not been idle and are both moving out. And uh, the President, I know, is very grateful. Uh, with that, uh, the uh, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who's also brought an extraordinary amount of visionary uh, energy to this effort, uh, uh, General Paul Selva, thank you so much. And the Chair recognizes you for your remarks. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you for your leadership and the leadership of the Council. To all of my colleagues, this has been a team effort. To the Deputy Secretary and the Principal Deputy Director, thank you for, for your uh, collegial work in this space, as well as the Secretary of the Air Force for her leadership in trying to get the organization right. Uh, General Dunford regrets that he can't be here today, um, but I will make just a very brief comment in his stead. The Joint Chiefs are, are unanimous in their support for the stand-up of a combatant command for space to focus our activities and our development of doctrine, tactics, techniques, procedures, and more importantly, to discuss the authorities, responsibilities, and rules of engagement for conduct in space, for the conduct of defensive and offensive operations to protect our constellation, to fight our constellation, and to support our warfighters 
in all domains and across all domains as we protect our ability to deploy civil, commercial, and military space to the benefit of the nation. And, and with that, Mr. Vice President, I will yield any time that's available to the balance of my colleagues on the Council. Uh, well, uh, with your, uh, thank you, General. Uh, thank you for your characteristic brevity, uh, but also thank you for uh, your, your tremendous uh, uh, collaboration on this uh, in your position uh, at, uh, with the Air Force uh, and as Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Um, uh, I'm, I'm always pleased to see the Chairman uh, present uh, for these occasions, but especially so uh, for you to be here today. Thank you for your energetic efforts. Uh, on behalf of uh, this effort and on behalf of the American people. Uh, with that, uh, the Chair recognizes um, uh, Colonel Andrea Thompson, who is the Under Secretary of State uh, for the uh, Department of State uh, and uh, an, an alumni of the Vice President's office. So uh, we're so pleased to see you taking a, a leading role in the State Department on behalf of the Secretary. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to, to serve with you and to continue to serve. It's a great honor to be able to represent Secretary Pompeo and the women and men of the State Department. Uh, much like uh, my partner in crime across the way with uh, General Selva, I'll keep my uh, remarks brief. Of, we'll submit the, uh, the statement for the, for the record, but uh, Without just objection. very briefly. Uh, as we meet today, I think it's important to note that American diplomats are up in New York at the United Nations engaging in discussions on space security issues and on cooperation on the peaceful use of space. Uh, they're working hard to implement the President's guidance and help, as you have said, Mr. Vice President, to ensure that our most cherished values and ideals are at the foundation of the future of boundless expanse of space. Uh, in these and in other international engagements, U.S. diplomacy continues to play its role in upholding our vital interests in space, to ensure unfettered access to and freedom to operate in space in order to advance America's security, economic prosperity, and scientific knowledge. And of course, as both you and the President have said, America first does not mean America alone. Therefore, the Department of State actively seeks constructive partnerships with our space, uh, spacefaring nations that share our goals of strengthening the safety, the stability, and sustainability of their and our space activities. Uh, at the same time, as uh, my DNA counterpart, uh, as Sue mentioned, at the same time, we must recognize that our competitors and adversaries have turned space into a warfighting domain. And the Department of State fully supports the President's proposal to establish a space force, as well as other reforms necessary to meet our U.S. national security objectives in light of existing and advancing threats, while maintaining the existing international laws and norms that we spoke of today that have supported American preeminence in space for decades. It's a great honor, and I look forward to continued uh, success with this team. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, thank, thank you uh, very much. Um, Uh, good report. Our regards to the Secretary. Thank you for your energetic support of this effort. Uh, and it's great to call you Under Secretary of State. It really is. Um, I'm going to recognize the Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget, uh, who, as, um, uh, as the Deputy Secretary of Defense said, has been working hand in glove uh, to address the budget issues associated with um, us moving toward the President's vision of a Space Force. Uh, Russ Vogt. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. This is a national imperative that will provide much needed organizational modernization and better position this nation to continue to use space to support our national security, our economy, and citizens. I also want to thank the panel members for their insights and perspectives, and I want to applaud my executive branch colleagues on the progress that they are making in pursuit of the various ongoing initiatives. OMB is continuously working with departments and agencies to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of federal functions. OMB also understands that strategic changes are often necessary to adapt to a changing environment. These types of changes are often difficult, and DOD space organization and management is no different. There is a clear and consistent chorus of independent studies including our own from just last year, regarding the need for strategic change in organizing, training, and equipping DOD forces. 
Uh, in preparation for this this morning, I read our report from last year, and one of the uh, statements that I found arresting was it said, this is the least capable our adversaries will ever be in space. We need to do it now. The Allard Commission best summarized up to stakes without significant improvements to the leadership and management of national security space programs. U.S. space preeminence will erode to the extent that space ceases to provide a competitive space security advantage. The President's vision is strongly supported by these studies, and OMB is working diligently to implement them. OMB has been working closely with DOD, and the Deputy Secretary of Defense has been a great partner in this endeavor. OMB is committed to properly resourcing the Space Force in the 2020 federal budget. OMB is also prepared to support the preparatory elements, primarily the U.S. Space Command and the senior civilian within the Office of the Secretary of Defense that are essential to the timely realization of the President's vision. While the proposal remains a work in progress, we have a very feasible path to a lean organizational structure that responsibly employs taxpayer resources. DOD is already performing a broad suite of space missions, and in the near term, the primary efforts will be to realign and consolidate the many disparate, organize, train, and equip functions, eliminating redundancies as we go along. Once the core organization is established in 2020, it will rapidly scale to assume responsibilities for the other services. This will be an iterative process that will be responsibly and deliberately transfer functions without disrupting ongoing activities. We will be finalizing the implementation path in the coming months. We look forward to rolling out the budget and the formal legislative proposal early next year. Mr. Vice President, we are honored to be a part of making the President's vision a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Russ Vogt. Thank you for your efforts on this. Well done. Uh, the chair will need to be uh, departing uh, sharply at the top of the hour, so I'm going to ask all the uh, uh, re remaining members of the National Space Council, if you have prepared remarks, we'd like to uh, have you submit them uh, to the record uh, uh, for a public consideration, and uh, uh, very grateful for your ongoing uh, counsel. With that, uh, uh, thank you all uh, for your comments and contributions today. And, um, the President's given us a very clear direction on the creation of Space Force, and now it's incumbent on the National Space Council to provide him with sound advice about how we move out. Um, uh, this discussion has certainly informed that, but to that end, I'm going to now recognize the Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, to describe our recommendations to the President on the creation of the United States Space Force. Patrick. Mr. President, before the Space Council are six recommendations to the President. As we move forward on establishing the Space Force, these have all been well coordinated among the members of the Council. Recommendation one guides the creation of a new unified Space Command. Recommendation two provides direction on the legislative proposal for the Space Force. Recommendation three addresses the fiscal year 2020 budget for the Space Force. Recommendation four outlines an interagency authorities review. Recommendation five establishes the Joint Space Development Agency. And recommendation six is on strengthening the relationship between the intelligence community and the Space Force. I ask the National Space, Account, Space Council to approve these recommendations. Uh, thank you, Deputy Secretary Shanahan. Uh, council members, you've heard the recommendations. Your agencies and departments have informed their development through the interagency process. Are there any outstanding comments or objections to the recommendations as described? Uh, seeing no objection, uh, I direct the Executive Secretary to enter the recommendations into the records of the National Space Council and create a publicly available fact sheet. Further, the Executive Secretary should prepare a memo to the President uh, from the Chair notifying him of these recommendations. Uh, and to uh, members of the National Space Council, our advisory group, and all that are looking on, uh, I would anticipate the President taking action uh, in the very near future on these recommendations uh, as warranted. Uh, he only asks me about the Space Force every week. So 
I know he will be very grateful for the energetic efforts and the substantive and thoughtful uh, recommendations brought forward by the experts uh, that we've heard from and the uh, agencies uh, that uh, are at the table and involved in this uh, effort. To close, let me thank everyone for joining us here for the fourth meeting of the National Space Council. It will be our last of calendar year 2018. We do anticipate a meeting, a meeting early uh, in uh, 2019 to continue the work uh, of uh, of the National Space Council. Um, and uh, it is our uh, expectation in 2019 that we may well see new American platforms uh, moving from American soil uh, into space. And uh, in fact, uh, platforms and rockets that shortly thereafter will begin to carry American astronauts into space. We are making progress uh, as Americans, and we should all be proud uh, of NASA. We should all be proud of the efforts all described here today. Uh, to the members of the National Space Council, to uh, Admiral Ellis, to members of the User Advisory Group, I want to thank you for uh, your ongoing contributions to this effort. We are just getting started. Uh, we are moving out, uh, but uh, the work has really just begun. Uh, I look forward to uh, working with each of you to make the next 16 months of the National Space Council as productive uh, for the President and for the American people as the first 16 months have been. Um, let me take a few uh, moments just to thank uh, a few folks before we dismiss. Um, the uh, staff of the National Space Council, Dr. Scott Pace, Jared Stout, everyone on our great team, I want to congratulate. Take, stand up and take a bow, would you please? Uh, to our distinguished uh, panelists uh, whose uh, testimony here today, but more importantly, uh, whose voice uh, in uh, the development of American policy has greatly contributed uh, to the progress that uh, we have uh, made uh, in the last year and a half. Join me in thanking this uh, remarkable group of experts for their efforts. Today. I also I want to thank our great host, Vice Admiral uh, Rogi, uh, who spoke at the outset of our meeting, and all the men and women of the National Defense University and here at the National uh, War College. Thank you for your hospitality. More importantly, uh, thank you uh, for your ongoing service uh, to the nation. Uh, uh, it uh, is my great honor that uh, now part of the history of this storied institution, uh, will be a meeting of the National Space Council where we forwarded recommendations to the President of the United States of America to form uh, the United States Space Force. So join me in thanking the National War College and uh, Vice Admiral Rogan. With that, uh, thanks to all of you and all those that are looking on uh, from afar. I can assure you that uh, the National Space Council and all of our members are going to continue to move forward uh, with uh, uh, cheerful impatience uh, to advance uh, the President's vision uh, for um, American leadership in space. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've been so struck by, uh, by a number of the comments that have been made today that uh, it is the unanimous recommendation of experts now for decades that America would take the step that we have begun in this administration to take. Um, we, will, we will do it on a bipartisan basis. We will do it enlisting the energy enthusiasm of the American people. And uh, we will do it with the support of all of you that are here and all that are looking on. Um, and with uh, your help, with President Trump's continued energetic leadership, with the strong support of the Congress, strong support of the Pentagon, our intelligence community, and all the agencies represented here. I believe we will make history, and we will launch the United States Space Force, and America will lead to a more peaceful and prosperous future in space for America and for all of mankind. Thank you all very much. God bless you.